Okay, epilogue. But all the same, what happened later in Moscow after the Saturday evening when Wolin left the capital, having disappeared from Sparrow Hills at sunset with his retinue, of the fact that for a long time a dense hum of the mo most incredible rumors went all over the capital and very quickly spread to remote and forsaken provincial places as well. Nothing need be said. It is even nauseating to repeat such rumors. The writer of these truthful lines himself personally on a trip to Feodosia heard a story on the train about 2,000 persons in Moscow coming out of a theater stark naked in the literal sense of the word and in that fashion returning home in taxi cabs. The whisper unclean powers was heard in queues waiting at dairy stores and tram cars, shops, apartments, kitchens on trains, both suburban and long distance and stations big and small at summer resorts and on beaches. The most developed and cultivated people, to be sure, took no part in this tale telling about the unclean powers that had visited Moscow, even laughed at them and tried to bring the tellers to reason. But all the same effect, as they say, is a fact, and to brush it aside without explanations is simply impossible. Someone had visited the capital. The nice little cinders left over from Gribodovs and many other things as well confirmed that only too eloquently. Cultivated people adopted the view of the investigation it had been the work of a gang of hypnotists and ventriloquists with a superb command of their art. Measures for catching them in Moscow as well as outside it were of course immediately and energetically taken, but most regrettably produced no results. The one calling himself Woland disappeared with all his company and neither returned to Moscow nor appeared anywhere else and did not manifest himself in any way. Quite naturally, the suggestion emerged that he had fled abroad, but there too he gave no signs of himself. The investigation of this case continued for a long time, because say what you will, it was a monstrous case, not to mention four burned down buildings and hundreds of people driven mad, there had been murders. Of two, this could be said with certainty of Berlioz and of that ill-fated employee of the Bureau for acquainting foreigners with places of interest in Moscow, the former Baron Michael. They had been murdered. The charred bones of the latter were discovered in apartment number 50 on Sadovaya Street after the fire was put out. Yes, there were victims, and these victims called for investigation. But there were other victims as well. Even after Woolen left the capital, these victims, sadly enough, were black cats. Approximately a hundred of these peaceful and useful animals devoted to mankind were shot or otherwise exterminated in various parts of the country. About a dozen cats, some badly disfigured, were delivered to police stations in various cities. For instance, in Arm of Veer, one of these perfectly guiltless beasts was brought to the police by some citizen with its front paws tied. This cat had been am ambushed by the citizen at the very moment when the animal, with a thievish look, how can it be helped if cats have this look? It is not because they are depraved, but because they are afraid lest some being stronger th than themselves, dogs or people, cause them some harm or offense. Both are very easy to do, but I assure you there is no credit in doing so. No, none at all. So then, with a thievish look, the cat was for some reason about to dash into the burdock. Falling upon the cat and tearing his necktie off to bind it, the citizen muttered venomously and threateningly, Aha, so now you've been so good as to come to our armavir, Mr. Hypnotist. Well, we're not afraid of you here. Don't pretend to be dumb. We know what kind of goose you are. The citizen brought the cat to the police, dragging the poor beast by its front paws, bound with the green necktie, giving its little kicks to make the cat walk, not otherwise than on its hind legs. You quit that, cried the citizen, accompanied by whistling boys. Quit playing the fool. It won't do. Kindly walk like everybody else. It's funny. The black cat only rolled its martyred eyes, being deprived by nature of the gift of speech. It cannot vindicate itself in any way. The poor beast owed its salvation, first of all, to the police, and then to its owner, a venerable old widow. As soon as the cat was delivered to the police station, it was realized that the citizen smelled rather strongly of alcohol, as a result of which his evidence was at once subject to doubt. And the little old lady, having meanwhile learned from neighbors that her cat had been hauled in, rushed to the station and arrived in the nick of time. She gave the most flattering references for the cat, explained that she had known it for five years since it was a kitten, that she vouched for it as for her own self, and proved that it had never been known to do anything bad and had never been to Moscow, as it had been born in Armavir, so there it had grown up and learned the catching of mice.
The cow was untied and returned to its owner, having tasted grief, it's true, and having learned by experience the meaning of error and slander. Besides cats, some minor unpleasantness, unpleasantnesses befell certain persons. Detained for a short time were, in Leningrad, the citizens of Wolman and Wolper and, and Saratov, Kiev, and Kharkov, three Volodins in Kazan, one Volk, Volaka, and in Penza, this for totally unknown reasons, doctor of chemical sciences, Vechen Kevich. True, he was enormously tall, very swarthy and dark-haired. In various places besides that, nine Korovins, four Korovkivs, Korovkins, and two Karavayevs were caught. A certain citizen was taken off the Sebastopol train and bound at the Belgorod station. This citizen had decided to entertain his fellow passengers with card tricks. In Yaroslavl, a citizen came to a restaurant at lunchtime carrying a premise which he had just picked up from being repaired. The moment they saw him, the two doormen abandoned their post in the coat room and fled, and after them fled all the restaurant's customers and personnel. With that, in some inexplicable fashion, the girl at the cash register had all the money disappear on her. There was much else, but one cannot remember everything. Again and again, justice must be done to the investigation. Every attempt was made not only to catch the criminals, but to explain all their mischief, and it was well explained, and these explanations cannot but be acknowledged as sensible and, and irrefutable. Representatives of the investigation and experienced psych psychiatrists established that members of the criminal gang, or one of them, perhaps, suspicion fell mainly on Koroviev, were hypnotists of unprecedented power who could show themselves not in the place where they actually were but in imaginary shifted positions along with that they could freely suggest to these they encountered that certain things or people were where they actually were not and contrary wise could remove from the field of vision things or people that were in fact to be found within that field of vision in the light of such in the light of such explanations, decidedly everything was clear, even what the citizens found most troublesome. The apparently quite inexplicable invul invulnerability of the cat shot at in apartment number 50 during the attempt to put him under arrest. There had been no cat on the chandelier naturally, nor had anyone even thought of returning their fire. The shooters had been aiming at an empty spot, while Koroviev, having suggested that the cat was acting up on the chandelier, was free to stand behind the shooters' backs, mugging and enjoying his enormous albeit criminally employed capacity for suggestion it was he of course who had set fire to the apartment by spilling the benzene steopa likodiev had of course never gone to any yalta such a stunt was beyond even Koroviev's powers nor had he sent any telegrams from there after fainting in the jeweler's wife's apartment frightened by a trick of Koroviev's who had shown him a cat holding a pickled mushroom on a fork he lay there until Koroviev jeering at him capped him with a shaggy felt hat and sent him to the moscow airport having first suggested to the representatives of the investigation who went to meet steopa that steopa would be getting off the plane from sebastopol True, the criminal investigation department in Yalta maintained that they had received the barefoot Steopa and had sent telegrams concerning, concerning Steopa to Moscow, but no copies of these telegrams were found in the files, from which the sad but absolutely invincible conclusion was drawn that the hypnotizing gang was able to hypnotize at, at, an, at an enormous distance, and not only individual persons but even whole groups of them. Under these circumstances, the criminals were able to drive people of most sturdy psychic makeup out of their minds. To say nothing of such trifles as the pack of cards in the pocket of someone in the stalls, the women's disappearing dresses, or the meowing beret, or other things of that sort. Such stunts can be pulled by any professional hypnotist of average ability on any stage, including the uncomplicated trick of tearing the head off the master of ceremonies. The talking cat was also sheer nonsense. To present people with such a cat, it is enough to have command of the basic principles of ventriloquism, and scarcely anyone will doubt that Koroviev's art went significantly beyond those principles. Yes, the point here lay not at all in packs of cards or the false letters in Nikonor Ivanovich's briefcase. These were all trifles. It was he, Koroviev, who had sent Berlioz to certain death under the tram car. It was he who had driven the poor poet Ivan homeless crazy. He who had made him have visions, see ancient Yerushalayim in tormenting dreams, and sun-scorched, waterless, bald mountain with three men hanging on posts. It was he and his gang who had made Margarita Nikolaevna and her mind 
or and her maid Natasha disappear from Moscow. Incidentally, the investigation considered this matter with special attention. It had to find out if the two women had been abducted by the gang of murderers and arsonists or had fled voluntarily with the criminal company. On the basis of the absurd on the basis of the absurd and incoherent evidence of Nikolai Ivanovich and considering the strange and insane note Margarita Nikolaevna had left for her husband, the note in which she wrote that she had gone off to become a witch, as well as the circumstance that Natasha had disappeared leaving all her clothes behind, the investigation concluded that both mistress and maid, like many others, had been hypnotized and had thus been abducted by the band. There also emerged the probability there also emerged the probably quite correct thought that the criminals had been attracted by the beauty of the two women. Yet what remained completely unclear to the investigation was the gang's motive in abducting the mental patient who called himself the master from the psychiatric clinic. This they never succeeded in establishing, nor did they succeed in obtaining the abduct abducted man's last name. Thus he vanished forever under the dead alias of number 118 from the first building. And so almost everything was explained, and the investigation came to an end as everything generally comes to an end. Several years passed, and the citizens began to forget Wolin, Koroviev, and the rest. Many changes took place in the lives of those who suffered from Wolin and his, att and his attendants, and however trifling and significant and insignificant those changes are, they still ought to be noted. This, he just wanted to keep writing, huh? George, George's Bengal Sky, for instance, after spending three months in the clinic, recovered and left it, but had to give up his work at the, ver the Variety. And that at the hottest time, when the public was flocking after tickets, the memory of black magic and its exposure proved very tenacious. Bengal Sky left the Variety, for he understood that to appear every night before 2,000 people, to be inevitably recognized and endlessly subjected to jeering questions of how he liked it better, with or without his head, was much too painful. And besides that, the master of ceremonies had lost a considerable dose of his gaiety, which is so necessary in his profession. He remained with the unpleasant, burdensome habit of falling every spring during the full moon into a state of anxiety, suddenly clutching his neck, looking around fearfully and weeping. These fits would pass, but all the same, since he had them, he could not continue in his former occupation. And so the master of ceremonies retired and started living on his savings, which, by his modest reckoning, were enough to last him fifteen years. He left and never again met rent Veronuka, who has gained universal popularity and affection by his responsiveness and politeness, incredible even among theater administrators. The free pass seekers, for instance, never refer to him otherwise than as father benefactor. One can call the variety at any time and always hear in the receiver a soft but sad voice, may I help you, and to the request that Veronuka be called to the phone, the same voice hastens to answer, at your service, and oh, how Ivan set Savalievich has suffered from his own politeness. Theopa Likodiev was to talk no more over the phone at the variety. Immediately after his release from the clinic where he spent eight days, Theopa was transferred to Rostov, taking up the position of manager of a large food store. Rumor has it that he has stopped drinking cheap wine altogether and drinks only vodka with black currant buds, which has greatly improved his health. They say he has become taciturn and keeps away from women. The removal of Stepan Bogdanovich from the variety did not bring Rimsky the joy of which he had been so greedily dreaming over the past several years. After the clinic in Kislovodsk, old, old as could be, his head wagging, the Finn director submitted his, re his resignation from the variety. The interesting thing was that his resignation was brought to the variety by Rimsky's wife. Grigory Danilovich himself found it beyond his strength to visit even during the daytime. The building where he had seen the cracked window pane flooded with moonlight and the long arm making its way to the lower latch. Having left the variety, the Finn director took a job with the Children's Marinette Theater in Zamos Zamosk Voyereki. In this theater, he no longer had to run into the much esteemed Arkady Apollonovich. Simply Yerov on matters of acoustics, the latter had been promptly transferred to Bryansk and appointed manager of a mushroom cannery. The Muscovites now eat salted and pickled mushrooms and cannot praise them enough, and they rejoice exceedingly over this transfer. Since it is a bygone thing, we may now say that Arkady Apolinovich's relations with acoustics never worked out very well, and as, and as a 
and as they had been, so they remained, no matter how he tried to improve them. Among persons who have broken with the theater, apart from Arkady Apolinovich, mention should be made of Nikonor Ivanovich Bolsoy. Though he had been con connected with the theater in no other way than by his love for free tickets, Nikonor Ivanovich not only goes to no sort of theater, either pain or free, but even changes countenance, countenance at any theatrical conversation. Besides the theater, he has come to hate, not to a lesser, but to a still greater degree, the poet Pushkin and the talented actor Sava Potapovich Kurolesov. The latter to such a degree that last year seen a black frame announcement in the newspaper that Sava Potapovich had suffered a stroke in the full bloom of his career. Nikonor Ivanovich turned so purple that he almost followed after Sava Potapovich and bellowed. Serves him right. Moreover, that same evening, Nikonor Ivanovich, in whom the death of the popular actor had evoked a great many painful memories, alone in the sole company of the full moon, Shining on Sadovaya got terribly drunk, and with each drink the cursed line of hateful figures got longer, and in this line were Duncho, Sergei Gera, Gera, Gerardovich, and the beautiful Ida Hercula Novna, and that red-haired owner of, of fighting geese and the candid Kanovkin Nikolai. Well, and what on earth happened to them? Good heavens, precisely nothing happened to them, or could happen, since they never actually existed. As that affable artiste, the master of ceremonies, never existed, nor the theater itself, nor that old pinch fist of an aunt, Paroko Havnikova, who kept currency riding in the cellar, and there certainly were no golden trumpets or impudent cooks. All this Nikonor Ivanovich merely dreamed under the influence of the nasty Koroviev. The only living person to fly into his dream was precisely Sava Potapovich, the actor, and he got mixed up in it. He got mixed up in it only because he was ingrained in Nikonor Ivanovich's memory and owing to his frequent performances on the radio. He existed, but the rest did not. So maybe Aloisi Mogoryich did not exist either. Oh no, he not only existed, but he exists even now and precisely in the post given up by Rimsky, that is, the post of Finn director of the variety. Coming to his senses about 24 hours after his visit to Wolin on a train somewhere near Vyatka, Alosi realized that having for some reason left Moscow in a darkened state of mind, he had forgotten to put on his trousers, but instead had stolen with an unknown purpose the completely useless household register of the builder. Paying a colossal sum of money to the conductor, Alosi acquired from him an old and greasy pair of pants, and in Vyatka he turned back. But alas, he did not find the builder's little house. The decrepit trash had been licked clean away by a fire, but Alosi was an extremely enterprising man. Two weeks later, he was living in a splendid room on Bryusovsky Lane, and a few months later, he was sitting in Rimsky's office. And as Rimsky had once suffered because of Stiopa, so now Veronuka was tormented because of Alosi. Ivan Selevyevich's only dream is that this Alosi should be removed somewhere out of sight, because as Veronuka sometimes whispers in intimate company, he has never in his life met such a scum as this Alosi, and he expects anything you like from this and he expects anything you like from this Alosi. However, the administrator is perhaps prejudiced. Alosi has not been known for any shady business or for any business at all. Unless, of course, we count this appointing someone else to replace the barman Sokov. For Andrei Fokic died of liver cancer in the clinic of the first MSU some ten months after Wolin's appearance in Moscow. Yet several years have passed, and the events truthfully described in this book have healed over and faded from memory, but not for everyone, not for everyone. Each year with the festal spring full moon, a man of about thirty or thirty-odd appears towards evening under the lindens at the Patriarch's Ponds, a reddish-haired, green-eyed, modestly dressed man. He is a researcher at the Institute of History and Philosophy, Professor Ivan Nikolaevich Ponyarev. Coming under the, the lindens, he always sits down on the same bench on which he sat that evening when Berlioz, long forgotten by all, saw the moon breaking to pieces for the last time in his life. Whole now, white at the start of the evening, then gold with the dark horse dragon, it floats over the former poet Ivan Nikolaevich and at the same time stays in place at its height. Ivan Nikolaevich is aware of everything. He knows and understands everything. He knows that as a young man, he fell victim to criminal hypnotists and was afterwards treated and cured. But he also knows that there are things he cannot manage. He cannot manage this spring full moon. As soon as it begins to approach, as soon as a luminary 
that once hung higher than the two five-branched candlesticks begins to swell and fill with gold. Ivan Nikolaevich becomes anxious, nervous. He loses appetite and sleep, waiting till the moon ripens. And when the full moon comes, nothing can keep Ivan Nikolaevich at home. Towards evening, he goes out and walks to the patriarch's ponds. Sitting on the bench, Ivan Nikolaevich openly talks to himself, smokes, squints now at the moon, now at the memorable turnstile. Ivan Nikolaevich spends an hour or two like this. Then he leaves his place and always following the same itinerary goes with empty and unseen eyes through Spiridonovka to the lanes of the Arbet. He passes the kerosene shop, turns by a lopsided old gaslight and stills up to a fence behind which he sees a luxuriant thought as yet unclothed. No, behind which he sees a luxuriant though as yet unclothed garden and in it a gothic mansion moon washed on the side with the triple bay window and dark on the other the professor does not know what draws him to the fence or who lives in the mansion but he does know that there is no fighting with himself on the night of the full moon besides he knows that he will inevitably see one and the same thing in the garden behind the fence he will see an elderly and respectable man with a little beard wearing a pince nez and with slightly piggish features Sitting on a bench, Ivan Nikolaevich always finds this resident of the mansion in one and the same dreamy pose. His eyes turn towards the moon. It is known to Ivan Nikolaevich that after admiring the moon, the seated man will unfailingly turn his gaze to the bay windows and fix it on them, as if expecting that they would presently be flung open and something extraordinary would appear on the window sill. The whole sequel Ivan Nikolaevich knows by heart. Here he must bury himself deeper behind the fence, for presently the seated man will begin to turn his head restlessly, to snatch at something in the air with a wandering gaze, to smile rapturously, and then he will suddenly clasp his hands in a sort of sweet anguish, and then he will murmur simply and rather loudly, Venus, Venus, ah, fool that I am. Gods, gods, Ivan Nikolaevich will begin to whisper, hiding behind the fence and never taking his kindly, his kindling eyes off the mysterious stranger, kindling eyes off the mysterious stranger here is one more of the moon's victims yes one more victim like me and the seated man will go on talking ah fool that i am why why didn't i fly off with her what were you afraid of old ass got yourself a certificate ah suffer now you old cretin it will go on like this until a window in the dark part of the mansion bangs something whitish appears in it and an unpleasant female voice rings out nikolai Ivanovitch, where are you what is this fantasy Want to catch malaria? Come and have tea. Here, of course, the seated man will recover his senses and reply in a lying voice. I wanted a breath of air, a breath of air, dearest. The air is so nice. And here he will get up from the bench, shake his fist on the sly at the closing ground floor window and trudge back to the house. Lying, he's lying. Oh, gods, how he's lying, Ivan Nikolaevich mutters as he leaves the fence. It's not the air that draws him to the garden. He sees something at the time of this spring full moon in the garden up there. Ah, I pay dearly to penetrate his mystery, to know who this Venus is that he, he's lost and, ha and now fruitlessly feels for in the air, trying to catch her. And the professor returns home completely ill. His wife pretends not to notice his condition and urges him to go to bed. But she herself does not go to bed and sits by the lamp with the book, looking with grieving eyes at the sleeper. She knows that Ivan Nikolaevich will wake up at dawn with painful cry. With a painful cry, will begin to weep and thrash. Therefore, there lies before her, prepared ahead of time, on the tablecloth under the lamp, a syringe and alcohol, and an ampoule of liquid the color of dark tea. The poor woman tied to a gravely ill man is now free and can sleep without apprehensions after the injection ivan nikolaevich will sleep till morning with a happy face having sublime and happy dreams unknown to her it is always one and the same thing that awakens the scholar and draws pitiful cries from him on the night of the full moon he sees some unnatural noseless executioner who leaping up and hooting somehow with his voice sticks his spear into the heart of Jestas, who is tied to a post and has gone insane but it is not the executioner who is frightening so much as the unnatural light, lighting in this dream caused by some dark and cl caused by some dark cloud boiling and heaving itself upon the earth as happens only during world catastrophes after the injection everything changes before the sleeping man a broad path of moonlight stretches from his bed to the window and a man in a white cloak with blood red lining gets on to this path and begins to walk towards the moon 
Besides him walks a man in a torn chiton and with a disfigured face. The walkers talk heatedly about something. They argue. They want to reach some understanding. Gods, gods, says that man in the cloak, turning his haughty face to his compassion. Turns his haughty, haughty face to his companion. Such a banal execution. But please, here the face turns from haughty to imploring. Tell me it never happened. I implore you, tell me it never happened. Well, of course it never happened, his companion replies in a hoarse voice. You imagined it. So, Cre Cretan. Cretan and then. Chiton. And you can swear it to me, the man in the cloak asks, ing ingratiatingly. Ingratiatingly. I swear it, replies his companion, and his eyes smile for some reason. I need nothing more. The man in the cloak exclaims in a husky voice and goes ever higher towards the moon, drawing his companion along. Behind him, a gigantic, sharp-eared dog walks calmly and majestically. Then the moonbeam boils up. A river of moonlight begins to gush from it and pours out in all directions. The moon rules and plays. The moon dances and frolics. Then a woman, boundless beauty, forms herself in the stream. And by the hand, she leads out to Ivan, a man overgrown with beard, who glances around fearfully. Ivan Nikolaevich recognizes him at once. It is number 118, his nocturnal guest. In his dream, Ivan Nikolaevich reaches his arms out to him and asks greedily. So it ended with that. It ended with that, my disciple, answers number 118. And then the women, and then the woman comes up to Ivan and says, Of course, with that, everything has ended and everything ends. And I will kiss you on the forehead and everything with you will be as it should be. She bends over. Ivan and kisses him on the forehead and Ivan reaches out to her and peers into her eyes but she retreats, retreats and together with her companion goes toward the moon. Then the moon begins to rage, it pours streams of light down right on Ivan. It sprays light in all directions, a flood of moonlight engulfs the room, the light heaves, rises higher, drowns the bed. It is then that Ivan Nikolaevich sleeps with a happy face. The next morning he wakes up silent but perfectly calm and well. His needled memory grows quiet. And until the next full moon, no one will trouble the professor. Neither the, neither the noseless killer of justice, nor the cruel fifth procurator of Judea, the equestrian Pontius Pilate. Nineteen twenty-eight to nineteen forty. The end. Ingratiating. All right. Peace.